So I'm going to kick us off. I'm sure we'll have folks rolling in, but uh, this is kind of the administrative side that I can get away with uh, sneaking in at the beginning. Um, so very quickly, my name is Sean Vitka. I'm director of the Fourth Amendment Advisory Committee and friend of the Advisory Committee on Transparency. I do that work from my perch as Senior Policy Counsel at Demand Progress Education Fund. Um, I'm about to turn it over to our panelists to get us started, but uh, I'm going to do a quick plug. Um, one, if you're interested in these issues uh, from the congressional side, the, we have a, a newsletter called First Branch Forecast that my boss Daniel Schumann runs. It's excellent. I strongly recommend you to join. And then we also have one that's focused on, generally speaking, civil liberties uh, domestically and what war means to them generally. Uh, that's the, called the Secure Liberties Newsletter. So please sign up for those. Um, but without further ado, I want to get us talking because, as Kathy was just saying, there is a lot to discuss here. Uh, so. I'm going to uh, just a couple ground rules here. The, again, as I said, the event will be recorded. There is an anonymous uh, Q&A function available. We'll have about 10 minutes for that at the end as best we can fit it in. Um, and yeah, there you go. So uh, one, thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I'm going to start out by inviting each of them to introduce themselves. This is going to be brief, not kind of longer introductory remarks. Um, but I have asked all of them to not only say who they are, but also identify one thing that they think everybody who is part of this discussion should know going into it. Um, I can't wait to hear what they have to say. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm going to start with Kathy and then go to Melissa and then go to Dr. Henriksen and then go to Michael. So uh, just letting that start. But Kathy, please kick us off. Okay, age before beauty. <laughs> um, I am Kathy Kiley. I'm the Lee Hills Chair in Free Press Studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. Uh, so I'm coming to you from Columbia, Missouri. We're about, uh, we call ourselves the middle of the middle, uh, halfway between uh, Kansas City and um, St. Louis. And uh, before coming here, before becoming a full-time uh, journalism teacher, I was a journalist for uh, many, many, many moons. Uh, and uh, that's how I know Sean. Uh, I was a reporter and uh, worked at the Sunlight Foundation with him, uh, but I was a reporter for many news organizations. And I would say in that capacity, most of my journalism career was in Washington, D.C., and I did a lot of coverage of uh, members of Congress and uh, presidents. And the one thing I would want to say about this is that every politician wants to control a message. Uh, the me they want to control the story about them. What makes the time we're living in so dangerous is that uh, political figures and particularly presidents have the power to control the message in ways that were unimaginable a few decades ago. So I think that's why this uh, discussion is really important. Our country has always been founded on the principle of checks and balances. And so coming up with some checks on the power to control the message, I think is vital for democracy. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, Melissa, please. Sure, Sean. Hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Wasser. Um, I'm a policy counsel with the Project on Government Oversight, or POGO. Um, at POGO, I handle a portfolio of uh, issues including whistleblower reform, uh, Freedom of Information Act reform, court access, press freedom, and OLC transparency. Prior to joining POGO, I was a policy analyst for the past two and a half years at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, um, a national nonprofit working to help journalists. And I handled a, a federal, state, and local portfolio of press freedom and government transparency issues. Um, I think just one thing everybody should know going into this discussion is obviously press freedom is worth protecting no matter who is in the White House, no matter who is in Congress. Um, and this conduct of this mass surveillance of journalists that we've been seeing and surveillance of members of Congress um, is a significant threat to our democratic society and our ideals. Uh, and if we don't codify some of these protections into law, I think our democracy will suffer because of it. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Melissa. And, uh, and we're gonna turn to Dr. Henriksen, who I'm actually gonna start by congratulating for uh, becoming a doctor between the invites going out and this panel. So. <laughs> Uh, happy to have you as a, uh, for your first doctorate uh, uh, speaking event, I think. Thank you so much. And it's great to be here with you guys today. Um, I'm Dr. Jennifer Henderson. I recently defended my dissertation from the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. 
And I'm also a fellow at Yale's Information Society Project, which is embedded within Yale Law School. And my research focuses on how challenges such as state surveillance or digital attacks against the media are creating an epistemic crisis for journalism, as well as journalism's role in a democratic society. And some of my more specific research that I just completed focuses on how journalistic intransigence to change uh, has implications for journalism's role in a democracy. So I think one thing that would be helpful for folks to know before starting this discussion in depth is just that the variety of attacks against journalists are increasing, they're diversifying, and the situation for journalism is getting worse. So we've seen an increase in political intimidation, an increase in online and offline harassment and threats, um, hacking of news organizations, as well as the monitoring of sources, and the capacity and the scope of surveillance, which we'll get at, you know, throughout this discussion is increasing as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Michael, please wrap us up here. Thanks, Sean. My name is Michael Ladora, and I work at the Committee to Protect Journalists as a Washington Advocacy Manager. Now, that would denote that I actually live in Washington, but as we were discussing offline before this call started, I've been living out the pandemic with my wife in Western New York, hence uh, my cottage life background. Um, but my job at the Committee to Protect Journalists is to engage with the US government on global press freedom and domestic press freedom. The one thing that I'd like to stress um, to people at the, at the beginning of the call is that the problem that we're discussing here is not new and as Jennifer and others have said is, is actually getting worse. Various administrations have used uh, government um, surveillance to spy on journalists' phone and email records and try to figure out who their sources are. And they've used the Espionage Act to prosecute those sources for leaking information that the government has deemed as a threat. These probes have a chilling effect on news gathering because they discourage government officials from speaking to reporters and journalists who are seeking to reveal important information about government activity. And that's a real problem for all of us. It's not just a problem for journalists and sources, but there's a flip side to press freedom. If we protect press freedom, we're naturally protecting the right of people to access information, information about what's going on in society, but also information about what's happening inside of the government. So by accepting uh, the landscape that is uh, that we're facing right now, that you know, the government will continue to go after journalists and their sources, we're accepting a landscape in which we are encouraging, if not giving cover to government secrecy. So it's something that I think we all need to be deeply alarmed about because it's not just something that affects journalists and their sources, but it affects what you as a, as a newsreader are able to read on news websites and newspapers every day. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna create a little bit of a framework for, for how this discussion is gonna go. Uh, so the panel is keeping the free press free. Uh, obviously, that's what we're talking about. The first third of this is going to be focused as much as we can. It's going to be freewheeling, of course, but uh, we're going to be focused on what the problem is and what it looks like and what its symptoms seem to be. Um, the middle part is going to be more about how it works, uh, kind of the gears that turn to make it happen. And then the last third is going to be the panelists talking about what they think can and should be done about it. Um, so with that said, uh, I'm going to turn over to Melissa, who I think is maybe uh, it was very well poised to tell us how we got here. Why are we having this conversation today? Why is this a, suddenly a news story again? Why is the news in the news? The news is in the news, of course. Well, I have a, just a quick timeline to kind of get people up to speed. Um, a lot has happened uh, just even in the past few months um, that show why all of these uh, surveillance, this surveillance has been a problem. So back in uh, May and June, it was reported that the Trump uh, Justice Department secret secretly obtained records uh, for phone records for three reporters at the Washington Post over prior reporting they had done about Russia's role in the 2016 election. There were also reports that uh, that same Trump Justice Department got phone and email records of CNN journalist Barbara Starr back in June 2017. Uh, they also seized uh, phone records of four New York Times reporters spanning nearly four months in 2017. And again, it's 2021 and we're just finding out about this. Um, and we also found out that uh, not just journalists were being um, kind of almost spied upon, but DOJ prosecutors under the Trump Justice Department also subpoenaed Apple uh, for the records of at least a dozen people 
um, surrounding House Intelligence Chair Adam Schiff, uh, Representative Eric Swalwell, aides and their family members. And this includes also a minor. Um, and normally, before going after a journalist sources, there is supposed to be some sort of notification requirement to the news organization that this is happening. However, uh, those uh, incidents had gag orders with them. So uh, Apple could not let people know that their information was being obtained and lawmakers didn't actually know that they were being investigated until last month. So this is extremely aggressive behavior to go after, you know, not only journalists and not only members of Congress, but their associated family members and minor children. So now um, after the election of President Joe Biden, um, back in June, Biden's Justice Department is now prohibiting the seizure of source information after these reports were obtained. Um, and the DOJ's Inspector General, which is the watchdog to make sure that the Justice Department is doing everything correctly, they are now looking into all leak investigations that would involve efforts to obtain records of reporters and members of Congress and their staff. Uh, again, this panel is super timely because just this week on Monday, in fact, Attorney General Merrick Garland issued a memo that uh, limits the government's ability to secretly obtain communications from journalists. Uh, federal investigators are now prohibited from obtaining these records, including phone records and electronic communications. Um, they also cannot compel testimony about these records um, unless they would somehow fall outside of news gathering activities. Uh, if the journalist is a target of a criminal investigation, if the journalist was determined to be an agent or a foreign power uh, of a foreign power, excuse me, or a member of a foreign terrorist organization, um, or when obtaining that material would prevent death or serious bodily harm. Um, I just want to take a second to, to let everybody know this is a momentous step forward um, to, pr to protect press freedom but we shouldn't get too complacent with that because it is a memo and it is just a policy. This is a policy, not a law. And so until these protections are embodied in the law, a future you know, Republican or Democratic administration uh, could rescind this down the line. And so we need to focus on taking these steps, you know, enjoying these gains and protections for journalists, but we need to make sure that they're codified moving forward so they can stay permanent. Thank you, Melissa. I want to invite uh, Michael as well to uh, talk about, well, you mentioned it before, this is not a new problem. So tell us about that. Yeah, so CPJ has been tracking this problem uh, for years and released a report on both the Obama and Trump administrations in our, uh, and the use of uh, the Espionage Act and, and surveillance of journalists. Um, we had found in our Obama report that all previous U.S. administrations had used the Espionage Act to accuse individuals of leaking classified information three times, and that under the Obama administration, I think we counted at least eight or nine different cases of the administration using the Espionage Act. So this is something that the, the Obama administration uh, carried forth into the Trump administration, unfortunately. And as, as Melissa said, there's a lot going on right now because we're finding out what the Trump administration was doing. But even, even the stories that we're hearing about right now um, are not necessarily from the last four years. Consider the case, you know, for example, of Daniel Hale, who just in May was arrested and jailed ahead of his sentencing. Daniel Hale was an Air Force intelligence analyst who leaked classified documents to journalists that were reportedly used in an eight-part series by The Intercept. And the documents that he leaked raised questions about the accuracy of drone strikes and targeting procedures by the Obama administration. Now, he's pled guilty under the Espionage Act and faces up to 10 years in prison. So this is a case that stretches way beyond the Trump administration, but is still ongoing right now. Now, the thing that I find really interesting about the Daniel Hell case, and this is not unique to the Daniel Hell case, is that um, after the series ran by The Intercept, the Obama administration had to publicly commit to further transparency under the drone program, including releasing estimates of uh, non-combatants who were killed in war zones like Afghanistan. Even though they were charging Daniel Hell for releasing those documents, they were admitting in public that he had a point. And there's often this sort of hypocrisy in these cases where the government knows the information is damning, 
and they may have to publicly address it to save face, but at the same time, they will still make a show of prosecuting the leaker. So again, just to reiterate, this is not this is not a problem that we're we're looking at and saying, well, this is something that the Trump administration was engaged in. It's really problematic. It's something that various administrations, going back to even the Bush administration, were engaged in, and the the record is really disturbing. Thank you. So, Kathy, um, uh, I'm really happy we have well, I'm happy we have everybody on the panel. But uh, Kathy is a veteran journalist, and so I'm honored that we get to have her expertise here. I wanted to turn to you. Um, you know, tell us what this feels like, looks like, does to journalists. Um, I think you're best qualified to, to tell anybody. Yeah, well, I think the most important thing here is not so much what it does to journalists. Uh, I think that it, it affects us through our sources. And I think uh, that's really who's in danger right now. Um, we obviously are only as good as our sources, so it affects journalists, but, but more in an indirect way, I would say, um, you know, I assume there are a lot of Hill staffers on this call, and it really affects you more than it does affect me or my students, uh, because in our system of government, there's a, a reason that the First Amendment, that journalism is mentioned in the First Amendment, and that is because the founders of this country, who were obsessed with checks and balances, thank God, um, recognize that journalism is in some ways kind of the court of last resort. If uh, you are working in an establishment and you can't make change and you see a wrong that needs to be righted, and, uh, and it's the whistleblowers who are most affected by this new technology because in the old days, I could promise confidentiality to a source and be pretty confident that I could preserve that confidentiality. I might have to go to jail to do it and I have colleagues who have done that, uh, but, but I could feel confident in telling the source that their identity would be protected. What has changed, and just to sort of take Melissa's timeline a little bit earlier, um, under George Bush, George W. Bush's administration, you know, post 9-11, we had a lot of laws enacted, which I think both conservatives and liberals were a little concerned about, you know, but the, the reaction to 9-11 was such that those concerns got shut aside. Uh, but that enables the government, our government, to go in and get information without a warrant. And that kind of opened the floodgates. And that, uh, that enabled now we, what we're now hearing about, which is people using this excuse of, oh, we're trying to protect government information to go in and get information, get phone records, get email records without the reporter or the reporter's news organization knowing that this is happening. And so if somebody on this call came to me and wanted to blow the whistle and said, can you protect me? I couldn't really say yes with, as, with nearly as much confidence as I could before. Uh, so it's the whistleblowers, I think. And it, you know, this is the point Michael was making earlier that whistleblowers are vital to our democracy. You know, we can go back to the Pentagon Papers, we can go back, I mean, I'm looking at my bookcase and there's a book by a guy named Jeffrey Sterling who says he didn't leak, but he did, he did blow the whistle on some things in the CIA, African-American CIA covert agent, his life has been completely ruined. I mean, he went to jail for two years uh, and that was under the Obama administration. So. You know, like I say, this is a, what we're trying to do is make sure that whistleblowers can comfortably go to the press and the press can in good conscience say, yes, we will protect you. Thank you, Kathy. It, uh, it's a very sobering way to bring us all the way back to today, of course, going to the phone records that have been seized here. Um, and it's, it, would it be right to say, it sounds like you're almost saying, you know, the, the fight to protect a journalist is almost lost before it's begun, before the relationship with the journalist starts. Uh, there, sorry, the fight to protect the source is already lost before, this may be already right. lost. Right, now, I mean, I think, I think everything we're hearing now um, is gonna chill a source before they even get to the reporter. 
because um, if you know that by picking up the phone or sending the email, you are now vulnerable to being discovered, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to go back. And some people are doing this, you know, going back to the days of meeting people in the garage, <laughs> like Deep Throat. But I mean, it, it, it puts many, many more hurdles um, in front of whistleblowers, I think, who, who want to speak out because the most commonly used channels of communication are vulnerable to you know, government gumshoes rifling in them without a warrant, you know, or without, without allowing the reporter or the news organization a right to defend themselves before the drawers are opened and the, and the files are gone through in effect. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so I want to get Dr. Henriksen in here. Um, so I'm going to ask you to, to speak to this first, but uh, Melissa and Michael, I suspect you have things to add here as well. Um, I, I want to scope out a little bit. Uh, you know, what are some of the broader implications of, of all of this? And, uh, you know, Dr. Henriksen, this is, this is your specialty. So please. Sure, thank you. So I want to just um, echo that I agree with everything that Kathy was just talking about, how important this issue is for journalistic sources and whistleblowers in particular. Um, and the fact that a lot of the big implications of government spying on the press is that surveillance does chill speech, right? Which in turn limits freedom of expression, which in turn leads to a less informed public sphere. And the public is so critical in order to ensure that we have a democracy. Um, so, so it's definitely problematic for, for democratic society if we aren't having these sources come forward, if journalists are reticent to cover certain issues because they're concerned about surveillance or they're concerned about not being able to protect their sources. And I would just say that there's also an, an adjacent issue at play here, which is that as trust decreases in a democracy, trust in democratic institutions like journalism also decrease. And as this trust decreases, attacks against journalists um, and their sources increase. So it's a two, you know, it's a multifold problem um, that really deserves attention uh, today. So that's I'll stop there. No, that's Thank you, um, Melissa, Michael. You know, I, I you know, I just want to, I want to keep keep us talking about what the what the consequences of these kinds of big big challenges that have just been identified are. Do you want to do you want to add to that, uh, Melissa? You first, perhaps. Sure. And I just wanted to go back to what Kathy was saying about whistleblowers because this is another part of my portfolio. Everything is so interconnected. But I'll just point out that maintaining anonymity is the best way to make sure that whistleblowers aren't um, retaliated against. Um, but that retaliation is almost expected when folks do blow the whistle. And right now, whistleblower protections haven't kept pace and there's no explicit right to anonymity. So there are, you know, bills in Congress trying to work to kind of fix that up. But, um, you know, whistleblowers are that first line of defense. Absolutely. Um, I would say the biggest implication right now is, you know, we have to figure out, I think, a legislative solution to stop the surveillance. Um, but not just of the press, but of everyone as new technology arises, um, how it could be used um, in an unrestricted manner. Again, we are in a very timely panel. There was a story last night that actually highlighted um, how a top US Catholic church official had to resign um, after his cell phone data was used to track him on um, Grindr, which is a queer dating app. Um, and they tracked him actually going to gay bars and this uh, in fall involved his phone data being uh, de uh, anonymized. And so it was reported on publicly. Now this data, that's not inherently illegal, right? But if it could be used against a member of the press, it could be used against anybody in the public sphere. Um, and this is gonna happen more and more when it comes to doxing, when it comes to outing, um, especially as people come to understand what data is available. And right now, there could be unrestricted personal use of this data that have severe ramifications for the privacy and safety of um, private citizens, including journalists. So, you know, just as another example, 
it's not just going after journalists, it's going after the people who are reading these really important stories. It was reported that the FBI demanded information from Gannett and USA Today that they wanted to identify not the journalists who wrote the article, but the readers of a USA Today article uh, that dealt with a shooting in Florida back in February. Uh, two FBI agents tragically lost their life and there were three others wounded. Um, the DOJ never told USA Today or Gannett um, that they took these steps. They later withdrew the subpoena, but again, they're going after the readers, people who are, you know, subscribing to journalism, you know, reading journalism. They're trying to get information and get this access to information. Um, so the implication there is we need legislative fixes to fix the loopholes. Um, right now, there is no federal law in the United States that restricts the collection um, or use of location data. So right now there's a bill, and I'm happy to go into it later, called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act, um, introduced by Senators Ron Wyden and Rand Paul, that would close that legal loophole that allows data brokers to sell information, um, Americans' personal information to law enforcement, intelligence agencies, or a third party. So until that's passed, I think surveillance is going to greatly expand of journalists and the general public um, that could cause greater issues. Uh, thank you, Melissa. And actually, I, uh, you just remind me that there's this article, it's a ProPublica article from, from uh, a while ago that, that's always stuck in my head where it's, it's, remember when the Patriot Act was about library records? Uh, and if you ever, if you ever want to see a, a kind of broad trajectory of the warrantless surveillance debate, uh, oh boy, is it an interesting reminder. Um, Michael, did you want to add anything here? Yeah, two, two quick points uh, about this really interesting discussion. Um, one is about the impact that this has had on journalists. And I know that Jennifer can speak to this uh, perhaps in more depth, but essentially the world in which we're living in now has forced journalists to think like spies. And one of the problems with this is that journalists are competing with spies and the spies have what you might consider to be home field advantage. I mean, they are the experts. And so the only way that journalists can protect the identity of their sources is through the application of of expertise and practice and, and sometimes really expensive tools. And so news organizations that did not previously have to spend resources on this are now having to hire security individuals and buy security tools. And all of that could be spent on research and writing. And it's really no different at the Committee to Protect Journalists. I mean, as an organization that is defending journalists, we've also had to think critically over the last couple of years about how we can protect ourselves and the sources that we're talking to to track uh, press freedom around the world. So that's one thing I wanted to, to, to spotlight, and I know that we'll talk more about it. The second thing is the impact around the world. I mean, the U.S. is perceived as a world leader on press freedom, and even if it isn't perceived as one, it acts like one. So any violations within the United States undermine its ability to act as a leader. Um, it allows governments to hammer the U.S. government in international forums like the United Nations, uh, when the U.S. is trying to raise criticisms about their press freedom violations, you have countries like China and Saudi Arabia saying, well, you know, look what's going on in your own backyard. Your government is spying on journalists. And so those governments then use it not just to hammer the United States in international forums, but also to justify their own behaviors. Well, if the U.S. is doing it, why can't we do it, too? And I think just to give one example of how what happens in the United States reverberates around the world is just to look at the numbers of imprisoned journalists uh, imprisoned on false news charges. And, you, know, you had four years of an administration with a president who consistently accused the news media and journalists of publishing fake news and of being fake news. And the number of journalists in prison for fake news consistently rose throughout the Trump administration. We actually also at CPJ have found cases of foreign leaders specifically citing President Trump in their own attacks against the press. You know, Trump has said that, you know, CNN is fake news. So why should I have to give any leverage to the, to the news reports that they're putting out there. And so it's really important to keep this in mind that we're talking about a domestic issue here in the United States that requires a domestic fix, but the rest of the world is watching. Thank you. Um, I, Dr. Think, I could just interject. I think that's a great point. And I think that's absolutely 100% true. Um, I think that the behavior uh, over the last couple of years towards the press in the United States has effectively greenlit much more thuggish behavior 
by uh, dictators and strongmen all over the world. We are, we are definitely, what we do in this country has reverberates around the world and has landed some journalists in jail and in great, great danger. Thank you both. Um, Dr. Henriksen, I, I wanna turn to you. The, you know, one of your focuses is on, well, your maybe the focus is surveillance of journalists. And I, I, wanna, I wanna get a better sense of what you're seeing because I, I suspect you're on the cutting edge of some of this. You may know things that uh, you know, we're gonna find out or read about in, in months or years. So, so what are you seeing? What is your uh, research pointing to? Sure, so um, I'm seeing that a variety of threats and attacks are happening against journalists. Um, and my research focuses more specifically on journalists in the US, but there's obviously a global dimension to this as well. Um, it's interesting, actually, I'm just thinking of like the US Press Freedom Tracker, which tracks different types of concerns facing journalists. That was developed in 2017 to focus more on domestic issues, to focus on journalists in the US. And prior to that, like CPJ had focused more internationally on journalists. So we're really seeing sort of a turn in that we're looking more inward about the different types of concerns and threats facing journalists to carry out their work. And those threats are, are things that I talked about a little bit at the beginning. So we have you know, concerns about surveillance, political intimidation, which we just touched upon, online harassment, um, as well as uh, offline harassment, the hacking of different news organizations, and the monitoring and investigation of sources. And these conditions really do affect what journalists are willing to report on, what information sources are willing to provide, or whether they even want to come forward. Um, with specifically with regard to online harassment, we're finding that journalists are removing themselves from different social media platforms like Twitter, for example, and engaging in self-censorship. And this might sound small, perhaps, that they're removing themselves from Twitter, but it has implications, right? One is self-censorship, which is huge. But two, I mean, they have limited digital publicity, which in turn affects their ability to communicate with sources, to publish their information um, more widely, to develop this network that they're required to do uh, you know, in today's society. Um, in turn, that also limits what information is available to the public. So it weakens this notion of an informed public sphere, which is critical for a democratic society. Um, we also know that news organizations are dealing with different hacking attempts. Uh, they've experienced distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks in which you know, their website has been taken offline for a period of time, limiting what information is available to readers or viewers. Um, some news organizations are experiencing ransomware attacks. Uh, that happened pretty recently um, with an outlet in San Francisco, and that has, you know, obvious, obvious financial uh, implications, but also it attacks sort of the credibility of the news organization and the ability of the news organization to continue its democratic role of providing information for the public. Some well-resourced organizations like the New York Times in particular um, is developing uh, and expanding its information security team. So it now has analysts and it has information security trainers and it's focusing on trying to ensure that journalists in the newsroom know about these different types of threats and, and have specific ways to protect themselves and their sources and their communications by adopting specific encryption technologies, for example, um, or engaging in sources after developing a risk assessment, for example, to understand you know, how their information could be accessed and used and the potential implications and repercussions of that occurring. Something else that I found in my research is that you know, most news organizations are not as well resourced as the New York Times, and instead there's this grassroots effort that's occurring across newsrooms in the U.S. where individuals who really care about security for various reasons, maybe they worked on the Snowden revelations, or maybe they just realized that, you know, cybersecurity is an increasing issue afflicting most of us globally now, but there are these particular security champions which are emerging in newsrooms, and they take it upon themselves to basically find out more information about information security, and then try to level the newsroom security culture up to be able to better address these types of, of concerns. Obviously, an individual approach is not a scalable approach, um, which points to the need you know, for different forms of legislation and policies and things like that. But it's interesting that specific individuals within news organizations are taking it upon themselves to address this deteriorating situation. 
Yeah, well, and it sounds like that, I mean, that sounds reflective of how seriously these entities are taking it, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hope it's not too late at, on one side, but, uh, you know, the Times dedicating a huge pool of people to uh, this project points to the severity of the issue, um, scalable or not. Um, so, so, Doctor, is it fair to say, you know, the we're, we've talked about a variety of different, I guess, pressures on journalists and their sources. So it's just, uh, mm -hmm. to some extent, you're pointing out that this is really beyond even where the conversation is today so far. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yes, um, I would say that. Yeah, that's fair to say. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wanted to invite you to talk. Um, uh, the, I'm thinking about Pegasus. Um, do you, do, okay. Would you want to spend any time to, covering Pegasus? I, I feel like it's, it's, it's recent news and it's important news. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about Pegasus. I'm also happy to share a work that I did with, a, she's a lawyer and law professor, um, Hannah Block-Weba from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, that talks more specifically about electronic communication surveillance and what news organizations might need to know. It goes in depth on you know, different statutes and things like that to, to keep in mind when you're engaging with sources in this new environment. Um, so the Pegasus project, which you, may have seen <laughs> explode on the newscape uh, this past weekend in particular, is basically this um, a coalition of news organizations came together, the Washington Post and 16 other media partners investigated. It comprised like 80 journalists in 10 countries. Essentially, they revealed, and I would, will also say that Citizen Lab has done a lot of work, Citizen Lab out of the University of Toronto has done a lot of work related to spyware and the effects on activists and, and um, journalists uh, over the past, like I would say, at least maybe six years or more. Um, yes. So it's not, this is not without uh, precedent. Professor yeah. Amnesty International also played a really key role, I think, in this, in this expose. Yeah, they yes, they did. Diversity. As did yeah. Yes, as did Forbidden Stories. Amnesty International, in particular, had a security uh, audit. Um, they were well. They provided uh, security analysis of the different types of infections that were happening against uh, individuals and their devices. So basically, um, it showed that you know spyware from the NSO group, which is based in Israel, the spyware is named Pegasus. It's uh, afflicting journalists, activists, a variety of even political leaders across the globe. And it just shows in some ways um, how pervasive these surveillance technologies are, how they are able to really infect even without any user activation. So I thought that was super interesting. Like they talk about a zero click ability. So it's not even, so in the past, like phishing emails or phishing links, uh, phishing attempts have often involved a specific link that the user has to click on, maybe enter some information, or maybe there's malware associated with that link, and then it compromises the user's device. But there's also these capabilities where the user actually doesn't do anything. And if they are targeted with certain types of spyware, their, their device is um, affected and they're, uh, they're infected. So it's just really fascinating and disturbing, like the, the depth and also the breadth of this, types of this type of surveillance that is um, seemingly increasingly occurring and has you know, dramatic imp uh, repercussions and implications for journalists and their abilities to carry out their watchdog role in a democratic society. Um, I will say too, I'll just point readers or view readers, viewers to the Washington Post just put out a video today um, that shows how this technology uh, works. And so I would encourage people to check that out. Um, it's very interesting, the nuts and bolts of how it happens. Thank you all. And uh, Michael, thank you for reminding me that I can I can send a chat to everybody in the in the uh, attendance list. So I'm going to I'm going to pull up the NSO Pegasus uh, business as well. But um, before I do that, um, so we've talked about, uh, you know, the, the concerns and we've talked about what the, the, you know, the larger consequences of those concerns. And we've talked a little bit about what it looks like or what some of the different pressures on journalists um, looks like how it functions. So I, I want to start talking about uh, solutions, about things that the panel thinks is important that um, anybody here who's a, a policymaker um, should be thinking about, if not moving on. Um, so, Kathy, I'd like to start with you. You know, where are you looking uh, to for answers uh, with regards to, to increased surveillance of journalists and their sources? Well, I mean, I think, it, and this gets to a point that Melissa made earlier, um, the, it's really important for Congress to act. Um, you know, right now we've talked about various presidents and things that they've done. 
um, that to attack journalists. I think right now we have an administration. Uh, Joe Biden certainly has a very sophisticated understanding of the media. He spent decades on the Hill. He interacted with reporters. He kind of understands the watchdog function of the press and knows how to take a punch and roll with it. And, and so that's great, but he's not gonna be president forever. And it really is important for the people of the United States through their elected representatives to speak on this issue. So I think when you look at bills like uh, the bill that uh, I believe it's Ron Wyden, Senator Wyden and Jamie Raskin on the House side have introduced, I think that uh, is, a, is a great step. Um, I think some of the other issues we've talked about here, one of the issues that came up in the Pegasus Project, uh, if you read those stories, is the company that sold the spyware that targeted journalists and, and world leaders um, is a, an Israeli company that was just able to sell this to anybody. You know, there's no regulation on this type of technology. And so I think we have to start looking at that. You know, what has happened in the last uh, 30 or so years is that there's been an explosion of new technology that we use to inform ourselves and also that makes us vulnerable. And our legislation and policy have not caught up with the technology. And I think I, I just want to make one other quick point uh, that has kind of been adumbrated by a lot of people on this panel. And that is, you know, we're talking about journalists, but we're really the canaries in the mine shaft here. I mean, you're, what you're hearing, if you look at Pegasus, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France was targeted. Um, so what journalists tend to be, uh, tend to be kind of on the cutting edge of some of this stuff. But when we're attacked, your freedoms are attacked. And so I think that's why this is so important. It's not just because of what it does to journalists. It be, it's because of what the implications are for free speech, free thought, and freedom of communication at large. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Michael, you know, especially for the, the policymakers in the room, what, what's the state of play of things? <laughs> Congressionally, yeah. the executive branch. Uh, Melissa's obviously taught, taught, touched on some of it, and we've made reference to uh, the Raskin bill. I just posted a link to that, by the way, in the in the chat. But yeah. Michael, yeah, give us a sense of this. So Melissa touched on um, some of the changes that Attorney General Merrick Garland has pursued at the at the Justice Department, and I think clearly the Biden administration has has displayed good efforts on this and, and goodwill to to change the way that the DOJ operates. Now, um, to be sure that didn't uh, result a, out of thin air, um, media organizations have been engaging, um, at least since the Obama administration, with the DOJ directly to encourage changes. And I think some of the changes you're seeing the Attorney General pursue right now are a result of just ongoing conversations that they've had with media organizations. But to be sure, the changes that Attorney General Merrick Garland is pursuing right now, the DOJ, could be reversed by future administrations. And that is why my fellow panelists here are talking about the importance of Congress acting, because if Congress makes it a law, then it's not something that a future Attorney General could just come in and say, well, I'm re redoing the guidelines or, or going to ignore them. And interestingly enough, in the memo that Attorney General Garland put out announcing the changes most recently, there is a line in there that the DOJ supports congressional action to make the changes that they're announcing permanent. Now, there have been efforts in Congress in the past to uh, achieve this, and there have also been a lot of challenges to those efforts. And I think the central challenge has been that in any law that Congress is going to write up and pass in this area, there has to be a definition of who is and who is not a covered journalist under the law. As an organization, CPJ is not as interested in who is and who is not a journalist. I think that's a theoretical debate that people can have. We're more interested in protecting the act of journalism. And that may include people who are new journalists or who are not considered by many people to be journalists, but they're engaging in acts of journalism, which are protected First Amendment rights. 
Um, so we have been working with congressional offices on a, a, a number of different measures in Congress. And yeah, there's a bill now out by Senator Ron Wyden and Representative Raskin. And the definition that they use in their bill is I think the most expansive that we've seen so far in any bill in Congress. It, it uh, states that a covered journalist is any person who gathers, prepares, collects, photographs, records, writes, edits, uh, publishes news or information concerning local, national, and international events. Um, and so I think this is a, a, a real step forward. I think that you also may see now Congress look to take some of what is coming out of the DOJ and simply trying to codify that into a law. So it'll be interesting to see how Congress reacts, whether uh, members of Congress see the Raskin Wyden bill as a vehicle, which I think is it is a very good one, or if they want to draw something up that's based on what Garland has put out. Now, just very quickly on the international side, because that is trying to fix the issue that we're seeing with the DOJ, but we're also dealing with this issue about Pegasus and spyware. And there have been some congressional efforts on, on this front too. There's a, uh, a measure by Representative John Curtis that would mandate that the State Department in their human rights reports every year include information about the use of surveillance technology against all individuals, including journalists. And I think that's a really important step forward because it provides a certain amount of transparency for uh, for the public about you know how frequent the how frequent governments and, and other actors are using these spyware technologies. Um, but Representative Tom Malinowski has also been really active on this and has proposed a number of measures that would limit the ability of the State Department and the US government to work uh, you know, with, with companies that are producing technologies that can be used uh, to, to spy on journalists. As an organization, we have been calling on governments to bar the use of spyware against journalists and media outlets and to bar the export uh, or transfer of surveillance technology to governments that have poor press freedom records. So. There's a lot more that needs to be done here. And I think Kathy made an excellent point, which is that the technology has outpaced uh, you know, the law, that we're in a position now where we're, we're behind um, as, as, you know, in terms of the US government um, and, and even the global framework. There are not many global frameworks that govern this either. So we're behind and a lot of people are trying to talk through what the solution is. And, and I think that it's a really important con conversation. <laughs> Congress is in a position where maybe they should be holding hearings about this to talk with you know experts in the field to figure out how should we be changing US law to respond to this. Yeah, if I could just jump on what you said, Michael, I think one of the reasons, it's a couple of things. One, we have precedent for export licenses on military technology. We sure, certainly should be doing something similar with surveillance technology. And we should know what countries are getting getting that technology. There should be transparency. That should be part of a, a regular report. Um, but the, the second thing I wanna say, and I wanna go back to why it's important for Congress to act. We're getting back to the global example we set. Congress speaks for the American people. There is a reason the quadrants of Washington emanate from Capitol Hill and not the White House. Congress speaks for the American people. Congress has to pass a law, not just to ensure that these are permanent changes, but also to send a signal to all the tin pot dictators and strongmen around the world that this is what America stands for. We don't stand for surveillance. We stand for free speech. And that, that is as, as important as making something permanent it's the sending the global signal, I think, that will make a big difference for journalists who are in much more perilous situations than, thank God, many of us are. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, so real quick, uh, I see, thankfully, we've got a, a question or two coming in as well. So it's a good chance to remind you that we will try to turn that as quickly as possible. Um, we've got a couple more minutes with the panel before we, we do a wrap up. Um, and I will get to those questions as quickly as I can. Um, Melissa, I want to turn to you to, to basically answer the same question, though. What, what is Pogo's take on what's next? Absolutely. So um, I, I'd agree with all the previous statements from both Michael and Kathy. Um, 
you know, first off on the surveillance of Congress and of journalists, Pogo recently sent a letter condemning that surveillance um, on behalf of 23 civil society organizations, um, which I am putting in the chat now for folks to take a look at on our website. Um, we sent that to Attorney General Garland, uh, along with the chairs and ranking members of the House and Senate Judiciary Committee, um, and, and, you know, let them know that there's wholly a lack of transparency by the DOJ around this. And this prevents public accountability and Congress needs to be able to use their oversight to hold hearings and figure out why this has happened um, to make sure that the DOJ can immediately release all relevant court filings or other records regarding the surveillance. Um, and those hearings should be you know, called to see why the surveillance took place. Um, I will mention that POGO does have our Congressional Oversight Initiative where uh, staff members uh, in Congress can sign up for trainings on how to hold hearings, how to maximize um, their congressional oversight power as well. Um, I will also mention without getting into too many details because it is not out yet, but POGO will have a forthcoming investigation that will reveal the extent of the crackdown under President Trump to go after journalistic sources. Um, that should be forthcoming soon by some of my colleagues and our investigators on our team. And back to, I know there's a question here about the Press Act. And, you know, again, the having a federal shield law would be the best way to ensure that journalists get that privilege to not have to reveal their sources. I'll mention that 49 states in the District of Columbia, so everywhere except Wyoming, uh, either have a state law um, or a recognized privilege that journalists do not need to turn over their sources, but until that protection exists at the federal level, um, and for the reasons Michael has mentioned, the definition of journalist, this is a very, very broad definition. I would also point folks in the direction uh, in the FOIA context. Um, under the Freedom of Information Act, you can uh, meet a requester status as a member or a representative of the news media um, that, again, focuses on news gathering, not so much who is a journalist, um, which seems to be the age-old question that kills every single one of these bills. It's, we should be focused on the aspects of news gathering, you know, taking, you know, those editorial skills, turning the raw materials into a distinct work and distributing that work out. Under some of these definitions, if you look at um, the uh, young woman, Darnella Frazier, who actually filmed the killing of George Floyd by police, she is not, who's someone who we would consider a journalist in the traditional sense, but her act of taking out that cell phone camera and having that First Amendment protected activity to record the police is journalism. I mean, that, those acts of what she's doing are, are acts of news gathering. And so we should be able to protect folks that are doing that work. Um, and again, it's very important just to wrap up that folks have those privacy protections for everyone. So that Fourth Amendment is not for sale act, I think is gonna be the main vehicle moving forward to kind of close those legal, legal loopholes as well. Yeah, and I, um, I think we'll, I think we'll have time to get to the this the question that was asked. But uh, you know, broadly, I think the panel's point is there are there are a variety of different challenges, and that may mean a variety of different legislative responses. Um, but I'm going to try to get to the, the the person who asked that question. I think knows knows that they asked it, and I'll, I will try to get there. Um, but first, Dr. Henriksen, um, before we do our wrap up set of questions, uh, what are we missing here? I mean, I think we've touched on a lot and I really appreciate the focus on legislation, um, potential legislation in particular, I guess to look at it a little bit more broadly, and it goes back to the surveillance technologies question is just also the need for the US to continue to support strong encryption. Because as I talked about in my in my work, I mean, journalists are somewhat taking this upon themselves, adopting different encrypted technologies to make sure that they can protect their sources. Uh, with because you know there isn't this federal shield law and other mechanisms to protect them. So I guess to think about it even more broadly is we need to continue to support um, the existence and use of strong encryption uh, so those technologies aren't weakened and so journalists can continue to use them in robust ways for their work. Um, thank you. Uh, so. Uh, all right, so I'm going to ask uh, everybody, I think we have time, we'll have time for one or two questions after this, um, running a little bit late, but it's been too good of a conversation to cut short. Um, I do want to turn to all of the panelists, though, and invite them um, to identify one thing they hope everyone takes away from this conversation. 
Uh, so I'm going to start with Michael and then Melissa and then Kathy and then Dr. Henderson. Sure. Well, it's difficult when talking about a time at which the press is under attack, um, unfortunately, like never before, to come up with, with one takeaway. I mean, we've had this conversation for 55 minutes, and I think we could have had it for hours. Um, there are topics within these conversations that we've had that you could focus on uh, specific events on. But what I'd like to, to focus on, given my, my role at, at the Committee to Protect Journalists, is, is to underline the global impact of everything that we're talking about. Given the historical commitments of the US government to freedom of the press, uh, the US government needs to take strong action in response to what we're seeing. And, and the panelists have really underscored this as well. I think the DOJ changes that Attorney General Garland are, is pursuing are really welcome, but Congress needs to follow suit by holding them accountable to their own guidelines to ensure the protection of constitutional rights and to consider legislation to ensure that future departments of justice do not abuse their authority. And secondly, on the, on the global front, that given the Pegasus leak that uh, was out this week and the ever increasing reporting about the use of spyware and surveillance technologies against journalists, Congress needs to get out ahead of this because um, it's behind right now and hold some hearings with experts to figure out what is the US law about this issue? Is it working? And if it's not working, and, and, and clearly it's not, um, what needs to be done? Thank you. Um, Melissa. Yeah, so I mean, we've, we've covered a lot. Um, and I think the one thing I hope everyone really takes away from this is, you know, surveillance of journalists and Americans is not new. Um, but how I, I really want to, you know, underscore how important um, and how serious of a threat this is to press freedom in the United States. Um, my background, I covered a lot of domestic, um, you know, press freedom issues. And so I, I'll stick on the domestic side and let others talk about um, internationally. But, um, you know, to have a fair and free press, journalists need to be able to do their jobs um, and protect their sources. Uh, these are, sometimes I think we think of them as like journalistic problems. These are democracy problems. We are seeing uh, problems within our democracy that are requiring legislative solutions. Um, and so that includes to make sure that the free press continues to thrive, um, that we get uh, whistleblowers better protected from retaliation, uh, that sources can continue to come forward without fear. Um, and again, I'll just, pivot really quickly that stronger whistleblower laws are really needed to make sure that uh, folks that see waste or wrongdoing or uh, you know a waste of taxpayer dollars can come forward to the press, to members of Congress with confidence that they won't and their careers won't be ended because of it. Um, and again, just a reminder, the DOJ memo is just policy. So POGO is going to continue to work towards getting statutory reforms uh, to surveillance and these gag orders against these news organizations uh, to make these changes permanent and to make sure that they're more transparent and accountable moving forward. Thank you, Melissa. Um, uh, Kathy, I'm about to turn to you, but uh, I'll flag uh, with the permission of the panel and if the Zoom gods allow us, we'll hang on for a couple more minutes to get to the questions uh, that have come in. Um, yeah, Kathy, I'll, please. I'll be really brief. This is not a journalism issue. This is a democracy issue. Thank you. Um, Dr. Henriksen. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I would just reiterate that the surveillance of journalists is a problem for democracy and democracy more generally is under threat. I, that would be my focus uh, for this takeaway question. I mean, for the past 14 years, democracies have been declining. Freedom House's Global Freedom Index has pinpointed this. And the problem with that is as democracies decline, protections for the press decline, and we're also seeing globally this rise in authoritarianism and populist movements, which in turn has implications for um, the continuation of democracy. So it's a bigger project, uh, bigger problem than just democracy. <laughs> it's thinking about it in the ecosystem of, um, in, in, in a global context of how democracies are decreasing and deteriorating um, and what to do about that. The, the continuation of democracy is, Quite a, quite a phrase. Um, uh, so uh, before we turn to Q&A, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for everybody who can stay on. Thank you to the panelists. You are all awesome. I really do appreciate you joining us for this. Um, and now I'm going to pull a couple questions here. So 
Uh, we have one, can you talk about the intersection of surveillance concerns and other laws that protect journalists' work, like shield laws, anti-slap, and access to public records? Will concerns over privacy lead to greater protections elsewhere? Which I think is a, a very interesting question, kind of orthogonal to the way we've been approaching this, but uh, very important nonetheless. Does anybody want to jump on that? Well, I'll, I'll just say that I think um, the, the Wyden uh, Raskin legislation, as I read it, is the new version of a shield law. Um, so uh, if that bill were to move, um, that takes care of that issue. I think to the extent, to, to um, echo what Michael said, I think to the extent that we can get congressional focus on uh, some of these issues, um, not just surveillance, but um, but the broader attacks on journalists that Jennifer has talked about, which are definitely there. I mean, we had a kid journalist spat on when she was trying to cover an election. Uh, you know, it, so it's real. It's out there. I talk to students every day, and I'm and I have to counsel them on how to protect themselves. So I think to the extent that we can raise those issues and have a conversation about them. Uh, and about what this means for democracy. Um, we may come up with some other things that we wanna change like access to public records, the FOIA laws definitely could use some updating. Um, but I think we just as a society, we have to stop and, and start to think about the implications to our democracy. I mean, what Jennifer was really saying when she said, I think we should talk about an ecosystem, I, I felt like, yeah, the world as we know it. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, you know, we've lived in this, uh, since really the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was this um, assumption that the triumph of democracy was uh, to be taken for granted. And we've certainly discovered that's not the case. So what are we gonna do about it? Thank you. Um, if anybody else wants to jump in on this, uh, please do so now, otherwise I'll move to the next question. Now, I'd like to add a, a quick note. You know, we've been talking about a wide range of press freedom issues, but a lot of these press freedom issues do include the angle of privacy and privacy rights laws surrounding the ability of a government to engage in surveillance don't just affect journalists. They also impact people uh, all, all across the country, whether it's the, their ability to read the news or the ability of the government to also surveil them. Just to give you one example, um, as an organization, the Committee to Protect Journalists and also the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, which has come up a, a few times in this conversation, have been working on the issue of the broad authority that Customs and Border uh, prote Protection has to search electronic devices at US borders. And we're calling it out as a press freedom issue, but it's a privacy issue too. Are people comfortable with the US government having broad authority to search their smartphones upon entering the United States? So this is something that as an organization, we've been trying to make the case both to policymakers and to people across the United States that just because we're calling it out as a press freedom issue doesn't mean that it doesn't also impact your privacy rights as well. Thank you. Um, all right, so moving to the next question. Uh, does the Press Act, the, the raskin Wyden bill, uh, the shield, new shield law, I think is how Kathy described it, um, does the Press Act effectively codify the DOJ's new policy or are there loopholes? Seems uh, like there are a lot of exceptions. Uh, and discretion persists in the memo. And concretely, does the DOJ support the Press Act? I, I can try and speak to that, the last point, Please. but um, I know in the DOJ memo, there were lines about um, that they support legislation, but I don't believe they have specifically endorsed um, the Press Act. And again, you know, I think this, this federal shield law by Raskin and Widener, it, it's a great start. I think these conversations need to be had and there should be a federal shield law. Um, but I think it's going to face the same uphill battle that it has in the past, especially if um, folks start getting into, again, we're talking about privacy and surveillance, um, something that failed, I think it was the 2013 version of the shield law was uh, a very broad national security exemption um, that just kind of, blew a hole into the bill and, and really ruined the way that reporters could try to protect their sources under the, you know, under the guise of, well, it's for national security. Um, and again, I think this press act is really, really important um, and make sure that 
journalists are protected against governmental overreach, any abuse of subpoena power, um, and to make sure that they can continue to do their jobs and hold the government accountable as the fourth estate. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, I, well, I, I think um, Melissa is definitely correct that the, the DOJ has not specifically endorsed the, the PRESS Act. The PRESS Act was introduced uh, before the new DOJ guidelines were out. And given um, all of the press freedom fires around the world, I've not had a chance yet to review the Wyden uh, legislation against or you know compare it to the new DOJ guidelines. And I think that's something that press freedom experts and certainly why Nebraska's office uh, office staff will, will have to do to make sure that it, it is encompassing of everything that, you know, the, the DOJ has been out front on. Um, thank you both. Um, I, I have one last question here and I'm gonna invite Dr. Henriksen to answer it first and then I think we'll be closing out. So one, anybody who stayed over five minutes, thank you everybody who's been here for the full hour, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we will wrap it up after this. So uh, Dr. Henriksen and anybody else who wants to jump in, what, what is, we, we talked a lot about this is getting worse. I think, I think two to four of you said this is getting worse and um, I think that's a really important message. Um, what does it getting worse look like to you? In other words, if there is no action, if there is no correction on these on this trajectory, um, what are you uh, afraid is going to happen next? What a positive question. All right. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I think it's a very important question. To me, what I would be the most concerned about is the how journalists and sources are not able to um, hold government leaders and powerful actors accountable because they might be concerned about um, you know being surveilled they might be concerned about being outed and then have to face jail time and things like that so to me it's a bigger question of um, the importance of being able to for journalists to do their jobs and for sources to come forward when they see abuses and that in turn has implications like i said in the beginning about what is the health of our democracy like we need we need journalists to be able to communicate important information to the public so the public sphere is informed and can also then um, make informed decisions which in turn you know make sure that our government reflects the interests of the people so to me it's it's a bigger question of the repercussions of potential self-censorship, freedom of expression, and a deterioration potentially of the public sphere and, and by consequence, uh, democracy. Thank you. And I'll invite anybody else who wants to chime in since this is our last question. Um, I'll just say that, you know, one of the things that's, um, to the extent that um, America is exceptional, <laughs> in some ways we are, in some ways we're not, uh, but we've been really um, uh, fortunate and to not, and to be free of a lot of corruption that you see in some of the other countries. One of the reasons we are is because we have a robust watchdogging press. And one of the things that powers that watchdogging is whistleblowers and sources. And uh, if you chill the sources and the journalism cannot expose wrongdoing, our society will deteriorate. That's the worst outcome. But one of the other things that um, powers journalism is readership. So subscribe to your local newspapers. Yes, amen. All right, unless anybody has anything else to add, I think that means we are at the end of the discussion. Thank you all so much. Again, I know I've said it before, but I can't say it enough. Um, congratulations again, Dr. Henriksen on your doctorate. Um, and thank you all to the panelists uh, and the attendees who, who joined us for this conversation. Um, we will uh, circulate- Thanks for listening. Uh, yeah, and we'll circulate some information, um, try to collect this and uh, there'll be a recording online if you know anybody else who's interested in watching. So thank you all again, take care and good luck. Thank you. Bye all. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks Bye. to the organizers.